Next Chapter Podcasts. Hey, Play On Podcast listeners. I want you to be a part of the cast. Become a supporting cast member with Play On Podcasts for just $5 a month. Get in-depth interviews featuring some of the most brilliant artists working today. I talk to actors, playwrights, directors, and producers from the worlds of theater and Hollywood, pulling back the curtain on why they got into their profession, why these stories are so relevant today, and providing context on the process of making these plays in the podcast format. You'll enjoy ad-free episodes of the Play On podcast series, and maybe even a gift or two. Head over to playonpodcasts.com Click Supporting Cast and join the club today. We so love creating this content for you, and we hope you'll support us so we can bring you inside this rejuvenated, reimagined Shakespearean world. Join the cast. Supporting Cast. Go to ncpodcasts.com. Hi. I'm Michael Goodfriend, executive producer of the Play On podcast series at Next Chapter Podcasts. These productions begin with the translation of the text into modern English verse by the playwright who has been commissioned through Play On Shakespeare. Often that playwright works closely with a dramaturg. And it's my pleasure today to have both of those people with me to talk about the Play On podcast series Twelfth Night. This is part two of my interview with Alison Carey and Leslie Cross. It's amazing to me, uh, Alison, while we were working on this, this production, that the Supreme Court, we got the the word, the the sort of the leaked ruling that Roe versus Wade was going to be overturned. Alison, what was that like for you? Uh, Did you make that, that sort of connection when you got word of this ruling that that we that that it correlates to this play did did it affect you in that way i think the religious um the 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 power of christian fundamentalists in our country is so profound a threat to the our ability to function as a democracy um well, I did not connect it to this place so much in that moment that, you know, where we were all got on the Zoom and were like, oh, um, I think it is below everything that we do in this country, um, this constant tension. And the ease with which Malvolio is sort of dealt with by the other characters, um, the, end, the play ends with Melvolio saying, I will be revenged on the whole pack of you. And are we seeing Malvolio get his way in the United States of America in 2022? We, we certainly are. I think that's a very apt observation. And I think it's, in some ways, it's the way, if you focus on that part of the play, the play misses its mark, except insofar as Shakespeare is warning us all when Mavolio makes that threat that we have to be on our guard, um, which, of course, we are insufficiently on our guard. And we have a system of government which is now being corrupted by Christian fundamentalists. Allison, you say if you focus on that part of the play, the play misses its mark. Why? Because the Malvolios of this world are more powerful than we'd like to imagine them to be. So if you're saying that 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 the making light of Malvolio, the 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 comedy of Malvolio, um, if you focus on the comedy of it, it doesn't it doesn't. Really... Yeah, because he's he's fairly easily dealt with. And so, again, I have to correct myself and say that Shakespeare in this warning of Malvolio saying I'll be back, Malvolios keep returning and keep returning and keep returning. Um, and certainly the character of Malvolio and the class system and how people are treated differently and who he's allowed to dream of marrying and who he's not allowed to dream of marrying. You know, there's it's 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 not a it's not a simple narrative, um, but to connect it to the political and the way I mean, there's 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 so many connections between um, the characters of any great play and 
the 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 moments the the common moments and the common <coughs> shortcomings that human beings share um, across centuries um, is 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 all there. But I do I do think it's a it's a it's a warning piece. And I do I mean I think just talking about the play one of the things I think especially the Chris Chris really more found finds in this play is the sort of deep grief that is everything in it. Um, everybody is suffering so profoundly and the, the idea, right. That from this, you know, time when it's cold and gray, this reminder that through the grief of whatever loss and pain you are experiencing in your life, you can, renew yourself and you can find love and you can learn new things that you didn't know about yourself. Um, that is, that is a, that is the engine of this play, right? So insofar as Malvolios are powerful, that's a terrible thing. It's also a reminder that to overcome the Malvolios is possible because you can continue, you can at the worst of times, find renewal in the company of fellow human beings. Um, and I, and I'll say one more thing, cause I'm, this is something I feel so passionately about, you know, I think one of the, you learn from the text, you can learn and learn and learn. And I would say when we were recording, Michael, you, you know, you were there, there would, an actor would say a line and I'd be like, Oh, Oh, I just kind of understood that line for the first time. Like, <laughs> and this is, I've been working on this play for a long time. So, you know, there, there is always that, that constant learning, but I, I think there's so much in the text. There's so much in this, in the way that the actors voices illuminate the text. But the, one of the great things about theater is that it's an example of how human beings can function together right? It's the most collaborative, most human of art forms. And it is, it is it, 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 the miracle that a whole bunch of sort of chaos agents, which because yeah, all human beings are chaos agents, managed to like put on a play, everybody worked together, like get it done. And by opening night when you're never really ready, but here you are and you're like all together. And then you, you connect with the audience and everybody's in it all together. And that power of connection, it is so profound in the moment of creating theater and of experiencing theater. If we could carry that sort of collaborative enthusiasm and possibility of world creating outside of our rehearsal rooms and into our lives and into our legislative halls and into our courtrooms, the belief that it is this collaboration and connection that makes us humans at their best. That, that is why I keep returning to theater because this, this it gives me strength and it shows me every day the possibilities of human collaboration and imagination. I'd also say that I, I think that that's a little bit that, that Allison's tapped in so beautifully and Chris, Chris Moore also um, uh, into what I think some of what Shakespeare was going through during this period of time because he had twin children, uh, a boy and a girl, and uh, his son died at the age of 11. Um, and so he was that that sort of like beginning situation of the play of a twin daughter left alone um, was the situation of his family. And so that grief um, that the play sort of like builds on um, was what he was feeling in his family. I mean, his, his son was named Hamnet. And the year before this, he wrote a play named Hamlet. Um, and so like that that grief um, uh is so in there, but he turns that grief into hope and into song um, uh, in, in probably one of the most musical plays um, uh, he ever wrote. But there's also that that tinge of melancholy in there with that that final moment with the Malvolio moment and with the um, with Festi's final song um, uh, that 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 has that sort of like rich humanness to the grief and hope 
and possibility of this piece. I want to ask about a character that uh, you mentioned, Leslie, Festi, and music. Can we talk about Festi and and what Festi really represents in the in the dramaturgy of the play? Um, and I'll, I'll start with you, Allison. Tell us, tell us who Festi is to you. Um, I will mention that uh, Festi is played by Rodney Garner in this yeah. podcast. So, um, Fe- Festi part of Festi will always be Rodney Gardner because can you imagine a better life? Um, One of the things that we actually, there's a little line that we added um, in this translation uh, and actually just for this podcast, because it was something that was so important to Chris and I, is that trying to make clear to the audience that when Feste appears at the beginning of the play, he has, we believe he has been gone since soon after the death of Olivia's brother. So, when he returns, and I don't want to give away the plot, but for, for your listeners, you know, his return to, you know, our, our theory is that Feste was very good friends with Olivia's brother and was overwhelmed with grief and left the home for months, who knows how long. And then, so when he comes back at the beginning of the play to the household, his, his presence starts the renewal process. Um, and certainly Viola's presence, uh, you know, so is, is the plot engine, right, of the beginning of the renewal process. But I think Feste is sort of the outside world who opens the window and lets the sun start to come in. Um, and it, 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 the example of him having, he sets an example for everybody that you can, reclaim your sense of self in the face of grief. Leslie, where do you think Festi originated in, in Shakespeare's writing? Was there a, a, a clown in the company that, that Shakespeare was writing for? Was there a person in society at that time that Festi might represent? Yeah, so, so Shakespeare worked with two major clowns um, uh, through his career. The first was Will Kemp, um, who was uh, famous for uh, dancing for nine days in a row um, from like Canterbury up somewhere else. Um, so it was called the Nine Days Wonder. Um, and Kemp was really good at jigs, A, eh? um, uh, and uh, little quips and like little sort of funny moments. Um, so Kemp was the clown in Shakespeare, the first part of Shakespeare's career. By the time we get to here, um, we have a new actor in the, the clown role, and his name was Robert Arman. Um, and he was a little bit more sardonic um, of an, uh, an actor. He had a, diff- a different sort of um, uh, uh, presence than Kemp did. Uh, he was also a musician, but not in that same sort of like jolly ha ha kind of way. Um, and uh Ke- uh, Armin was was most likely the first Festi, um, uh, and uh, he was probably also Lear's fool, and he was also probably the first grave digger, um, uh, and so like that 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 style of clown, which is a different kind of style. There's more wordplay. Um, there's uh, that sort of like wise insight um, uh, that. Uh, drives some of the the feeling of this particular character. So this was a journey in Shakespeare's company and possibly even influential in in Shakespeare's writing, going from sort of a broad, sticky kind of comedy to something more incisive, more satirical, more pointed. Yeah, and I would also say that that was the style of the era as well. Um, if you look at what some of the other dramatists are doing during this the, this uh, sort of shift in time, um, the comedy moves from um, uh, 
uh, broader, more slapstick into a little bit more satire, a little bit more biting. Um, uh, the challenge, of course, is that Shakespeare is writing and all the rest of the dramatists of the era are writing under fairly tough censorship laws um, uh, where legitimately like Ben Johnson got thrown in jail more than once for something that he wrote in one of his comedies. So one of the things that Shakespeare is doing is trying to do that um, uh, sharp biting wit where you're sort of getting at people, but without ever getting thrown in jail or getting his nose slit, which was one of the other things that they did to people. Um, what do you mean? What was the nose slitting? Uh, they took your nose and right across the like base of it right here they would slice it open oh my god yep for for going too far with the comedy uh or or, or anything that was thought to be seditious in a play wow. chris rock got off easy huh? oh yes chris rock would not have been okay in elizabethan england <laughs> <laughs> um so do uh, we know leslie do we know was it will kemp's decision to leave was he pushed out by the queen who didn't like his style of oh, comedy uh, no, I, I think he, he died. Trying to, oh okay yeah yeah it was so, it was just sort of a, a a passing of the torch people didn't live very long back then um, so will kemp uh, died and it opened up this this yeah, new vein this new era which was also part of where the style was going i mean we're moving into um, uh, dramatists like Thomas Middleton, who co-wrote Time and of Athens with uh, William Shakespeare, who was a much darker dramatist. We're moving into much more of the revenge tragedies of John Webster. Um, so that the the style of of theater is moving to something um, uh, more complicated and darker um, during this this period of time. But I think what's interesting about Festy in this moment is that he is a truth teller and he speaks truth to power, but he does it in this riddling fashion that to this day, we're not entirely sure what he means. And I don't think the Elizabethans were either. And I think that's part of what kept Shakespeare safe. There is no record of Shakespeare ever getting in trouble because of something he wrote. There are records of almost every other dramatist of the era getting in trouble because of something they wrote. So I think that there's something about the equivocation of how Shakespeare writes these biting characters that keeps them dancing just on that knife says you're being provocative, but not so provocative that you end up in jail or in financial trouble because there are also fines or in physical trouble. Um, I also want to sort of add that um, very early on in this, we haven't talked about this at all yet, but uh, very early on in the process, Allison and I um, we're sitting down, we're at Martino's, which is the, the bar across from the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, where many of us have sat for many times. Um, and we were talking about like, how do we even launch into this with both of us knowing it so well? And Allison said to me, I think what we need is somebody who knows the play, not at all, to tell us where they don't understand what's going on. So we did this experiment with a group of high school students at Issaquah High School in Washington. Um, uh, and we had them uh, in partnership with a friend of mine named Shannon Henderson, who's a high school teacher there. Um, uh, we had them do as part of their Shakespeare class, uh, their own translation of Twelfth Night, um, which was an incredible experience for them uh, and completely changed the way that they thought about Shakespeare and the way that they engaged with Shakespeare. Um, and they were like, it was so cool. We got to make it our own. Um, uh, and you sort of really demonstrated how great this translation process is as an educational tool. Um, but the point I'm trying to get around to is that one of the challenges they really found when they were tackling this was Festy because they're like, it doesn't make sense. And they're like, we have to try to make sense out of it. And they pushed against it and pushed against it and pushed against it. And finally, what these kids figured out was that he doesn't make sense on purpose. And that, that uh, the idea of someone being purposefully oblique um, uh, was what they, what they sort of like came to. And I think that was a really interesting revelation for us as we went forward into the translation process of, someone who is purposefully oblique um, and potentially because of the censorship that was going on in the era. I want to talk about uh, 
how this production was tailored for the podcast medium. Allison, was it a logical leap for you to, you know, envision this production being for ears only, or was that a, a challenge? Oh, I think, no, I think it's, I think it's delightful. I mean, I, I, I never questioned it as being anything other than an incredibly good idea. I think because as a theater practitioner, Shakespeare was a man of the word, right? He wasn't an auteur in the, in that sort of, I'm going to give you a very long stage direction of how this should look. And that, so to connect with the words and, you know, it, 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 it was enough the words were enough. Well, of course, he didn't write the plays down, but that's another story. But, you know, he, the words of Shakespeare is what um, Shakespeare thought was sufficient to, to the to his job. So just hearing the words, I think, is fantastic. Well, and it, Leslie, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, from what I know about the Globe Theater, which is where Shakespeare's plays were presented mostly, right, the, the, there were plenty of people who could not see what was going on. Yeah, I mean, so this this play was originally performed um, at the, the at court, so it would be at the ends of court. Um, uh, but sight lines were not their uh, immediate uh, uh, worry. So yes, I mean, I think that at this this time, uh, theater was an auditory event. I mean, there's a reason we call it the audience. And the, uh, yes, and then there's a reason why in about the mid 19th century we start calling them spectators, because the in the 19th century we change from listening to a play to watching a play, um, and that's the point in time where we start having a lot more spectacle and we start having plays where we burn down uh, buildings and we have bridges collapse and that the 19th century brings us all of that, but before that we, we had auditors who came to listen to a play. So I think there's something very uh, appropriate about these plays going back to being for auditors um, and the audience who are listening to it. Allison, you and Chris decided you wanted to set this in a sort of a New York, you, you, you talked about how, you know, Shakespeare's um, Twelfth Night is, is in Shakespeare land. You wanted to put it in, in a a, a New York-ish kind of place that that sort of references the Hamptons and the city in the golden age of radio, right in the like the 1930s -ish era. Why that choice? Well, I think a, a little bit of it's an homage to a production that uh, Chris directed at uh, Oregon Shakespeare Festival, which was set um, sort of in the in in the the imagined uh, glorious heyday of Hollywood. Um, and so starting there, we use that as a, as a sort of stepping off point, um, especially around uh, a lot of the music. Because once you're in podcast land and you're looking at, um, you know, a, a time when radio was very uh, important, right? then it only makes sense to kind of uh, lean into that, the, the style of language and certainly the style of delivery. You know, you think of a lot of um, the movies like My Front Page where people talk really fast and they don't, you know, it's not about landing the moment and taking the breath and having the realization that, you know, the audience can see it on your face. It's about go, go, go. And that I think is very much in the spirit of um, Shakespeare comedies. And so, you know, once we sort of landed in, um, in the world of what is heard than to push it to a time period when radio was super important as a creator of community and a communicator of meeting, meaning and all that um, was sort of a, a natural next step. Something that Chris and I both started doing um, in the beginning of the rehearsal process was we would put our heads down um, mm -hmm. so that we couldn't see the actors' faces because it's so different just to listen and to even see somebody on a Zoom screen, an actor. We were lucky to have that in the rehearsal process. We could see each other's faces, which made chatting more fun. Um, but obviously your audience wouldn't have that. So it was very important for both Chris and I to look, to experience it without our eyes experiencing what the actors are doing on the Zoom screen. Um, the, the joy and the bounce from having a whole bunch of actors bring their own energy and seeing what the big combined billowing cloud of fabulousness results 
um, is always a delight. And as I mentioned before, he, actors were coming up with things, making choices that made me learn things about the play every day, every day. And it's so exciting and fun. And, you know, there are a lot of uh, old friends um, in this production. And I won't name everybody's name. Um, but if you're listening, uh, audience out there, go make sure you know these people's names because they're all each and every one of them remarkable and talented and as responsible for what's happening in your ears as either myself or Christopher Lee Moore, as great a director as he is. You know, it's you know, without without the actors, it's just typing. Great segue into one of my final questions. Uh, Leslie, what is it that you hope that people will take away from hearing this series? Joy. I don't know, have fun with it. Um, I, I think that, that one of the, the great things about um, the, this podcast series is the accessibility of it. And I think that that is the goal of the Play On Project all the way around, is how do we bring Shakespeare uh, to people in more accessible ways. And as an educator, I'm always looking for what's that gateway drug that's going to get them in. Um, and uh, I would love for, for this piece to be one of those gateway drugs for someone that, that then they decide they want to take that next, next Shakespeare step in uh, and start exploring the plays more because there's a lifetime of riches there. Um, uh, so somebody with two degrees in this subject. Um, uh, and so there's, there's, there's just so much to explore. And, um, and the beauty of these plays is that you can revisit them over and over again, and they renew themselves in remarkable ways. I'm actually directing Twelfth Night in the Spring, um, uh, and it will be different than all of the other Twelfth Nights I've been a part of because I, we will have that unique chemistry of that group of actors with that particular text and this particular audience in our space, um, you know, and, and that's, that's the joy of these. So um, I would say uh, ha find some joy in, in this iteration and then go find more iterations. Go make your own. Make your own iteration. I like that. I think we'll make that a slogan of, of yeah. uh, our production company. I'm going to get a little scholarly and nerdy real quick. So uh, during the 20th century, um, uh, there was a big shift in Shakespeare studies where we realized that Shakespeare was very unstable, um, uh, meaning that, that you can't say this one thing is Shakespeare. And if you look at the like long history of Shakespeare textual studies and Shakespeare performance studies, what Shakespeare is, is iterative. And every generation reinvents Shakespeare for themselves in whatever way they need to for where they are. Um, uh, and, you know, there's great books about this. You know, Jan Cott's Shakespeare, Our Contemporary, um, uh, talks about how Shakespeare has this ability to be fashioned and refashioned. Um, and there's no reason why, uh, you know, folks listening to this podcast can't also refashion Shakespeare themselves. Like, go do a little bit of your own translation if you don't like what Allison has done, um, <laughs> because that invitation is 100% there and it's an incredible way to get to know the place. Allison, is there anything that you want to add to this? Do you, what is your wish for the audience? Everything that Leslie said. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I think that sort of going back to thinking about the, about the, a podcast, this this particular podcast version of Shakespeare in this series, is that when you when you just hear something, your brain has to do the work of an artist, right? Because uh, with no disrespect to the fabulous sound technicians that are going to create an oral world, your brain is going to keep working. And in the process of your brain working and see and bringing to life inside your brain what you're hearing through your ears, you are participating in the making of art, right? You, all, all audience members are artists, right? Because it's part of a collaborative process. But I do think, um, I do think podcasts specifically, and I think it's one of the reasons they're so popular, right? Is because your, your brain is, is is required to participate in a way that when you see something, 
you are you can simply accept, oh, well, this is the world I'm seeing on stage. It's a different thing. And I'm not saying uh, and I don't want to do this live theater because it's fabulous. But I do think that, that the podcast has the possibility of such a direct participation in the creation of the art because your brain is going to make a picture. Right. And your brain is going to decide what people look like and your brain is going to decide what are the what's on the walls behind, you know, the actors when they're talking. And so the it fits so well with it in terms of what Leslie's talking about Shakespeare being iterative, right? Is that um, the greatest gift, right? That art gives is to remind you that you're an artist and to require of you to become an artist and to participate in this world creation. And as I said before, that sets an example, right? For how we can function as a society and how we can create, keep creating the world moving forward is, to recognize that one, you're gonna do it anyway, even if you're not intentional, but two, that we have maps, we have examples of human beings who say, look, we're gonna create a world together. And once you believe that world creation is possible, and once you believe the example that art making sets for you, and once you participate, whether throwing it through your headphones or being on stage or however, when you participate in this making of art, then you remind yourself of the possibilities of being a human being and being a human being in society with other human beings. We'll leave it there because what more could possibly be said? Uh, Alison Carey, Leslie Cross, it's been a real pleasure having you with me today and being a part of this discussion. I am sure it is edifying and elevating and inspiring for our listeners as well. It's been a real pleasure having you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thank Michael. You. you can learn more about the Play On Podcasts at Next Chapter Podcasts website, ncpodcasts.com. That's N as in next, C as in chapter, podcasts with an S at the end, dot com, where you can find other Play On Podcast series and interviews, along with talk podcasts like the 500, the 10, the Tough Juice Podcast with Koran Butler, and a whole lot more. I'd like to thank Jeremiah Tittle the founder of Next Chapter Podcasts, and my producer, Peter Musto. Our audio engineer is Adam Bernard, and our editor and sound designer is Justin Cortese. Be sure to subscribe to Next Chapter Podcasts for updates on all the latest content, and don't forget to rate and review our shows. I'm Michael Goodfriend, and I look forward to sharing more incredible works and scripted fiction with you, along with lots of enlightening bonus content at Next Chapter Podcasts. Next Chapter Podcasts.